Hi guys, welcome back. I'm Craig and I'm a software developer in the UK and over the previous five videos prior to this one, we've been learning how to select elements that we can then apply styles to. Burrowing down into our documents and targeting the right elements is really 90% of the battle with CSS. The rest is just adding the styles. So having looked at basic and advanced combinator selectors, then pseudo classes in the last video, we're going to finish off this mini section by complementing all of that by looking at something called pseudo elements. So in the last video, we found that a CSS pseudo class is just a special keyword that we can add onto the end of any kind of selector that will specify a unique style state of an element triggered by a user. We also said that we can think of a pseudo class as the act of assigning a phantom class that applies new style rules. When an element is in a given UI state, a phantom class is applied to the element, adding new styles. So pseudo classes assign phantom classes to elements and pseudo elements insert phantom elements into a document in order to achieve certain effects. Syntactically, pseudo elements look similar to pseudo classes. So here in the file for the last project, we added a hover effect to an anchor element and the hover pseudo class was written with a single colon. For pseudo elements, we would use a double colon. The double colon helps us to distinguish between pseudo elements and pseudo classes in CSS3, which is the current standard. In CSS2, the previous standard, both pseudo elements and pseudo classes were written with a single colon. So for backward compatibility and for older code bases, all modern browsers will still accept single colon pseudo elements. That's not an excuse to be lazy though. We want our CSS to be modern, up to date and technically correct and future proof. Most importantly, it's possible at some point down the line that browsers might stop accepting single colon pseudo element selectors. So I've got a simple sandbox project open here in VS Code. And as always, you can find the links to the starting and ending code in the description below. All I've got here is a simple HTML file that has a link style sheets. Style.css contains some pre-written styles and is also where we'll write our pseudo elements for this page. To get the code, you can go about it in a couple of ways. You can either download it from this GitHub repo using this green download button. And then once you have it, you can open it in your text editor of choice. That's VS Code in my case. It contains both the starting files, where I'll begin from in this video, and the files in the state that they're going to be in at the video's conclusion. Alternatively, you might not be able to download the project if you're working on a public computer, say in a library or at school, for example, so you can find the same starting and ending files on CodePen. Any pseudo classes that we add in this video will just go at the bottom underneath the general styles, and I've added comments to indicate where to write each pseudo element that we look at. You don't need to create a CodePen account to work with these projects and you can start coding as soon as you open any links. It does help if you do have an account and I would recommend it as CodePen is a really good resource. It's free and you can save any pens that you work with to your own profile and then you can come back later on. Okay, so the first pseudo element that we're going to look at is first line. And this does probably what you think it does. If we look at the MDN page for pseudo elements and scroll down to where it says index of standard pseudo elements, we have a selection of around, what, 14 elements here, pseudo elements here. And though we won't look at all of these due to the time in practicality in this video, we'll look at as many as we reasonably can. And any others that we don't look at that you are interested in, you can find all of the info on them right here. So if we select first line, it says that it applies styles to the first line of a block level element. So in our text editor, we have this paragraph which we can select with a simple element selector and we will give it the color of blue. That's straightforward enough, but what if we wanted the first line to be styled totally differently? A larger font size or perhaps bolder, italic or even a different color. What that first line is can change as well depending on the device that it's being viewed upon or the size of the browser window. When I adjust the browser window, what text 
is in the first line changes. Well, whatever this text is, even if it changes based on viewport width, we can select it with the first line pseudo element. So I'll duplicate what I have here, and I want the first line to be red instead of blue. So we'll go to the selector and we'll add our double colons to initiate a pseudo element selector. And the one that we want, of course, is first line. So when we save, we have a blue paragraph, but the first line is red. Now, what's in that first line can vary, of course, as I said, if we adjust the window size or zoom in and out or if we're viewing it on a 4k tv as opposed to on an iphone in addition to the first line we can select the first letter and the first letter pseudo element styles the first letter of any non-inline element so i'll duplicate the first line selector and change it to first letter and if we wanted a big green and mean first letter of any paragraph an incredible hulk type letter if you like then we could say the color is green the font size is twice as big so let's say 200 percent and the font weight is bold the first letter pseudo element is probably most commonly used to create what is called an initial or drop cap effect, which is a letter at the beginning of a chapter or a paragraph that is larger than the rest of the text. You'd commonly see this in many books and also in newspapers. So to do that, we'd float the letter to the left and floating left places whatever you select to the left of its container, allowing text and inline elements to wrap around it. Then we'll add some padding and as we want to stand out, we will change the font to a standard serif font. And that gives us a similar effect to what we see here on the Telegraph, which is a newspaper in the UK that uses this drop cap effect on its website. There is an initial letter property currently being proposed for inclusion in CSS3 via the inline layout module level 3, and you can find information about that here at this link. This would give us one CSS property that would create the effects that I've just shown you, but at the moment it has not yet been fully accepted and implemented in CSS3. At the moment, only Safari browsers um, have some support for this property. The first letter and first line pseudo elements can currently be applied only to block display elements such as headings and paragraphs and not to inline elements like hyperlinks. There are also limits on the CSS properties that may be applied to first line and first letter and you can find information about what these are on the MDN pages for each pseudo element under where it says allowable properties. For first letter, these are all font, background, margin, padding and border properties, plus colour and similar but slightly different text and alignment properties as first line. If you're ever unsure, then always refer back to MDN. They have all of the information right here. Okay, so let's say that you wanted to add a lightning bolt emoji or two before every H2 element on the page. We could go into the HTML, add a span to wrap the emojis, then use the Mac emoji menu to add a lightning bolt, and I'll copy and paste that again so that we have two. Then we could go down to the next H2 and do exactly the same, and any time I add another subheading that I want these to proceed, I could do the same thing, but that's a lot of unnecessary work. By the way, in case you're interested, I pulled that emoji menu up on Mac by hitting Command, Control and Space. Microsoft added an emoji menu to Windows from Windows 10 on, and it is the Windows key plus a semicolon or a full stop. If you're on an earlier version of Windows, I've added the emojis in the description below and you can copy and paste them in. So we've just seen that putting these emojis in is too much work in HTML. So what we'll do instead is use CSS, which allows us to insert generated content and then style it using pseudo element selectors. In this case, these are the before and after pseudo elements. So before and after are ways for us to add extra style or content to our web pages without the need for adding additional markup. So let's undo what we've added to the HTML and instead we can create an H2 selector and give it the before pseudo element. To actually use a pseudo element, nothing is actually going to happen until a pseudo element exists. And for it to exist, it needs some content. So if I say H2 before, and we'll want our pseudo element to display as an inline block. It will have a background color of orange, we'll give it a padding of 10 pixels, 
and a border radius of 50%. Now this should give us a little orange circle before all of our H2 elements, but if we save we see that there's nothing as this phantom pseudo element actually has no content, and we rectify that simply by using the CSS content property to create some generated content. This can even be just some empty space, so we'll create a string that contains no characters. Now when we save we have given our pseudo elements content that they will display. Well, what about these two lightning bolts? Here, we'll give our content property the value of our two lightning bolt emojis. I'll delete all of the styles that created the orange circles, and when we save, we see that the circles are gone, and we've now replaced them with some lightning bolts. And without touching the HTML, we've added some content to the page using just CSS. So there's no extra markup, and the content was generated, and that's uh, pretty cool. If we inspect the element, we see before isn't actually adding content before the element itself. The content coming from the pseudo element is actually being generated before the standard content. It's the same with the after pseudo class which we're going to see shortly. Content belonging to this pseudo element is generated after the content of the element as opposed to being after the element itself. We don't have to just add empty space or emojis. This could quite easily be text content as well. So we could say h1 before, and we'll add the content of the text main with a space at the end so that the words are not going to be smushed together. And we save and our text is in the heading now and it says main heading. Main from the CSS and heading from the HTML. So to distinguish that, I'm also going to give the before pseudo element the color of purple. To place content after an element, we instead use the after pseudo element. To demonstrate this quickly, I'll duplicate the before on the H1 and change it to after, and we're gonna say that the color is deep sky blue. And for the content, this time will be type with a space in front of the text again, so the text from the actual H1 isn't smushed together with the text from the after pseudo element. If we inspect the H1, we see that we have the main content, which is heading, and the before and after are both inside the H1, so before and after the content, rather than being before and after the element, so they are actually part of the H1. We have these list items here, and I'll select them first to make sure I'm getting all of them, and I will make those the color of magenta. Okay, so I'll duplicate this and add the after pseudo element, and now I'll give it some content to add after, and this time I'll give it an image to add after. So here, I'm just going to add a Nike logo because I've read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight fairly recently, and that's a great book if you ever wanna check it out, and Using the URL value, we can just add the path to the logo in here as a string. And I have this shortened URL, which you can find again below in the description. So I'll add in this URL and save, and now all of our LI elements have the Nike logo added after them. Though we can add images in this way using pseudo elements, I wouldn't advise it as the image that you're adding before or after is inserted as its exact dimensions and it cannot be sized at all, which isn't really good for responsive web design. Okay, so we've looked at first line, first letter, before and after, and in the last video where we were working with pseudo classes, we also looked at the placeholder pseudo elements, which allows us to style placeholders in input elements. And if you want to watch that, I'll leave a link to the exact spot in the video where I'll cover that below in the description. I think these four elements that we've covered here are the most commonly used pseudo elements and demonstrate well how these fake elements are working, that we're essentially creating phantom elements and are then applying styles to them. The other pseudo elements here will go over in separate videos when we're discussing complementary content. So the last thing for us to do is to end our work here and do it with the after pseudo element and we'll apply that to the entire body. And of course, we'll add the text of the end. Okay, so we'll stop here. This concludes our work on selectors. We've had six videos now, including this one, where we've learned to traverse our documents and really burrow down into our files and target exactly the elements that we're looking for. We've learned to select elements by name, class, and ID, and also by their relationship with either a parent and child or with a sibling. We've learned to use pseudo classes, which allow us to target elements when they are in a given UI state, like they're being hovered, for example, and we've learned how to 
create phantom pseudo elements and select them to target with our styles. By using selectors based on the document structure, we can create CSS rules that apply to a large number of similar elements just as easily as they can construct rules that apply in very narrow circumstances. The ability to group together both selectors and rules keeps style sheets compact and flexible, which incidentally leads to smaller file sizes and faster download times for our sites. If you found this video useful, then please remember to smash the like button, subscribe, share, and all of that good stuff, as it really helps us out with YouTube's algorithm, and it makes the channel much more discoverable for people that can genuinely benefit from the content that we share. Also, reach out to us on social media or in the comments below if you've got any questions or feedback, or even if you just want to say hi, and the links to all of the resources used in this video are in the description, like they always are. And if there's any other useful resources that you know of that we haven't included, please add them in the comment section below and I will add them to the description if they are relevant to the content of the video. So thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. Join me in the very next video in which we're going to be talking about a concept that we have touched on fleetingly and that is of specificity in CSS. And specificity is the idea that when an element has more than one selector trying to apply styles to it, some styles are inevitably going to clash and can't all be applied at once. So CSS needs some kind of rule or law which governs how it decides which of the clashing styles to apply in any given circumstance. So specificity then is a score or rank that determines which styles will win over the others and which style is then ultimately applied to a given element. So watch out for that video in the next few days if you're interested and thanks again for watching. I really do appreciate your time and I will see you in the next one.